My name is Mike Holden. Mm -hmm. I was born in a small railroad town, Spencer, North Carolina. 1946, July the 22nd. My mother had nine brothers. Seven of them went to World War II. My dad had to go to work somewhere else, so he went to work with a company called Selenese in Charlotte, <clears throat> North Carolina. And uh, so we moved to Charlotte in 1956. So when I grew up, my parents literally put a key around a, a chain around my neck. I'd go to school and come home and open my door. Mm -hmm. go into my house. I knew that I couldn't leave my block, so that's how safe it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just a, it's best years of America, in my opinion. You know, on TV, it was just wild. So my aunt had married a fellow that lived in New Jersey, so she took us to New York, first time I ever rode on an airplane. So we went to Macy's, and I bought the cap and the gun and the pistol and all that, and that was the deal, you know. Did your family have a TV, or did you grow yeah. up on radio? No, we grew up on radio. Matter of fact, on Friday nights, my parents would lay in the bed, my sister and I would lean up against the wall and listen to the radio. The Lone Ranger, all that kind of stuff. So then when it was over, we went to bed. So we, Saturday mornings, uh, a doctor in, you know, in town, he had a TV. So all the kids would go down there and we'd watch them. So we grew up in a very family-oriented, I mean, Sunday you went to church, you came home, you sat down as a family, you ate, you prayed. And then I'd go out and play, do whatever I wanted to do. Then you got up and you went to school and you did what you were told to do. Your teachers taught you, very friendly. That was the big Anyway, I uh, graduated from high school. I played football. What year did you graduate high school? 1964. How nationally or news aware were you of the time? Did you know what was going on in Vietnam or did you not really keep up with the news? You didn't know about it. All right, there was no TV about Vietnam. Oh, they, they'd say, oh, the war in Vietnam, we were just, Congress decided to send more troops or something. Advisors at that time? Mm -hmm. Advisors. Yeah. Well, the first guys came in in uh, June or July of the Marines of 1965. And that's when the troops started coming in, pouring in. Kennedy started the Special Forces at Fort Bragg. And, quote, and you can look it up, John F. Kennedy, I want all combat troops out of Vietnam by November of 65. Two months later, he was assassinated. And that you can see Cronkite interviewing black and white TV. Politically, they thought it would be a short little war, and then they would say, we won the war. Yeah. It didn't happen. It was a lie. I graduated from high school, wanted to go to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, but it was very difficult in those days. Even though it's a state school, it was a small population. Yeah. And I did not graduate with A's. I went the uh, junior college route, got mm -hmm. my A's degree, and got my dreaded letter. Okay, now now it's time for me to go get my physical. And they right. said, come and get your physical. 18 years old, and you walk out in your mail, and there it is. So here, there, this is dated October 1966. Mm -hmm. And because... You'll hold it up a little higher. Yeah, because I was a, uh, a student deferral, they put me over in the uh, not now but soon <laughs> list. So I... They, re, they gave me a new draft card. What happened there was uh, I finished my AS degree. I had to work two jobs to get the money to go to Chapel Hill, and they got me in between. So I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Yeah. But this is a copy of the dreaded letter that tells you you will be, you're in the process of being drafted. If you didn't show up, they put out a warrant for your arrest, and if they caught you, You'd go in front of a judge and he'd say, two years in jail or go down and sign up for the military. You had no choice, no option. That's when they started running to Canada. That's when the news started coming in about being drafted, going to Vietnam. So in this in-between time, before you were being shipped off anywhere, even to boot camp, how did you prepare for your sudden new career that you're going to have in the Army? My book takes you through that. Okay. My book uh, says, I got the letter what happened, the events that happened, and there's some good ones. And then you wake up, you're at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, shave your head, uh, full metal jacket. That's the kind of barracks we were in, and that's the kind of... The drill instructors talk about brutal. It was a different world. So Marine drill instructors and Army drill instructors are very comparable? Uh, father and son, yeah, they're okay. just alike. Okay. And they did that. The reason they shaved your hair and put you in green uniforms and boots, and it didn't matter where you came from, what color you came from, you were greeny with a bald head and you're going to listen to me. You're going to mm -hmm. do what I say do. 
because you're going to be a no. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility you're never going to come back home. So you better listen to me. The fear God was put into me. I was older. I was 20 years old at that point, getting ready to turn 21. Most of the guys were just out of high school. Yeah. I mean, graduated from high school, had their summer, and then 60, 90 days later, they were they were at boot camp also. And when you saw a thousand, two thousand guys coming into Bragg on buses, and then you saw them going out, uh, we were going to graduate from basic training. And they said, call your family, tell them not to come. We're going to put you on airplanes. You're going to New Orleans. You're going to Fort Polk, Louisiana. I was supposed to go to Fort Benjamin Harris to be uh, basically a, an aide to a senior officer. That would have been a silk job. <laughs> I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana, and there we were. And then we knew we were going to Vietnam. If you went to Fort Polk, you were going to Vietnam, period. So is the reason for that because Fort Polk's training centers offer an environment that's good Conducive. for teaching against uh, for yeah. Vietnam due, due to the terrain that they yeah. have there? Exactly. Now, Fort Polk, we went in uh, and Green Beret, 5th Special Forces guys meeting us at the bus. Okay. Veterans? Yeah. yeah. Just come on from now. Okay. And I said, whoa. So anyway, we go up there and uh, intense, just like basic, but you're going to live or die. You okay. got a choice. Listen or mess around, you're going to get killed. And so all of a sudden the death tolls start coming back. How many American boys were being killed? And and then, about what time period is this? That's, um, that was mid-67, then Ted hit. Okay, and then so really summer 67? Yeah. Okay. And then it really hit the fan when Ted hit. So anyway, Fort Polk, and I was selected to go to Fort Benning, Georgia. And it was a new school called Instant NCO School. And I went through the number six class. So what does instant NCO school mean? Uh, instead of becoming an officer, I became a, a, a staff sergeant. Okay. All right, so um, we went for the first 10 or 11 weeks, we, we worked right along the officers, and then we moved out. And then, because uh, I was only in the sixth class, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was new to them, training us. So I graduated and uh, kept all my manuals and everything. Everything to do with the platoon, uh, whether it was mortars setting up, going on, or, uh, different ambushes going on, recon. We were sitting in an arena situation and he said, gentlemen, first time we'd ever been called anything other than bad stuff. <laughs> Take your hats off, it's what they refer to them. Listen to me. I was captured, I was in Vietnam, I was captured in South Vietnam. I spent a year. No, he said, I think a year. He said, me talking to you is, is a conscious mind. When I scratch my ear and I'm talking to you, that's my subconscious mind and I want you to reverse it. That's what we're here to teach. And it, it got out of the children, get in line, fall in, fall out, do this, do that. It's a uh, listen to me. Take in what I'm saying, I've been there. Yeah. It's horrible. When you see the back of the head of one of your buddies explode, or you see the chest torn apart from fragmentation, we're gonna teach you, you're getting ready to enter the gates of hell. And I used that in my book two or three times. He used that term, the gates of hell. I can't tell you what it's like. You're going to have to, but your chances of dying are pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. Half of you boys in there won't be here. So it was dead serious. You're going into an environment that, you, that we can't teach you. We can teach you what we know and how to react. And um, so that was the type. At that time, we were men. We were trainees up until that point. They were whipping us into shape by saying, you're in this green army and your head is shaved and you're no different than the man beside you. But it's your responsibility to look after him and he looks after you. Nobody's left behind under any circumstance. You'll do anything that you can to save your buddy. Reality hits real strong. In 1968, we lost 16,899 men in one year. I graduated January the 22nd. <laughs> the number 22 follows me. So they gave us our uh, money for the month, their, our pay, gave us our orders, mm -hmm. and we had 30 days to report uh, to Fort Ord, California. I write a chapter about that. The feelings that I had. I mean, my dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta leave my dog. Yeah. My family. And luckily, I didn't have a... A wife. Um, uh, a wife, number one. Number two, that I didn't have a girlfriend that I was about to die over. Well, I didn't, no pun intended. But, uh, <clears throat> so I wasn't tied down. 
So when I left Fort Benning, my job immediately, immediately, was going to land, go out in the field, and take charge of a squad. Benoit. Mm -hmm. It was nighttime, and we could see nothing. We saw lights, and then we'd see tracers here and tracers there. This is the 22nd that you you landed. No, uh, I left on the, on the 21st. I landed at Wake Island. Well, went back time, in time, basically. In time, basically. Went back. You know? Yeah. So we went ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it would have been the 20. It was the 23rd, but it would have been the 22nd if we'd have left from California. Right. So um, we landed, and um, they were having a, an attack in uh, they call the Y Bridge, uh, coming into Vietnam, uh, Saigon. And Benoit came out of Cambodia. Yeah. And then the Y Bridge came across. Uh, to the Saigon River, and Benoit was up here in the east. So we landed at Benoit, and they took us down. And um, so for about two days, we just uh, we were just fresh green troops holding a rifle, just pulling secure. And then they put us back on the buses and sent us back to Benoit. So uh, we went through the regimentation, and uh, talk. Uh, there was thousands of people at this place, thousands, and. Uh, so I went down to the NCO club because I was already a sergeant and here I've been in the military for a short right, time. Right. And you saw the guys that had uh, real heavy suntans, you knew they were out in the field. Yeah. The hair was scraggly. Then you saw guys leaving and they were drunk and partying and everything. And then mm -hmm. you saw people that were just sort of collected in groups, quarters. And my bunk was number 22. Mm -hmm. This was at Benoit Air Base? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's called 90th Replacement Center. 90th it, it's all around Ben White's huge. We went in there and uh, they just gave us the basic standing orders, get your shots done, do this, do that, etc. Do that tomorrow, you're going to do this, do that. And after about the third day, uh, they had us fall in. So we fall in in ranks and they come out and call out names. And they left and then they would say, from here to the right, sidestep two. We'd sidestep two and they'd bring a whole column in. They would go get issued all of our gear, etc. And then they, you got orders to go. I was going to the 1st Infantry Division, Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 16th Infantry Rangers. Wait over there and you'll get on trucks. So they put us on trucks and drove us over to Zeon. Mm -hmm. It's spelled D-I-A-N but pronounced Zeon. Then they assigned me to uh, my company, my platoon. Next morning, the helicopter picked me up and I'm in the field. So here I am, a staff sergeant, going to take over a squad of men that's been there six, eight, nine, ten months. And I'm a newbie. I mean, I've been fed all this information. Um, a guy that was a squad leader had de roast meaning he went back to the States. So they assumed that I had more knowledge and ed education and training in combat. And what I did was when I got in, I said, there's some of you guys getting ready to go home, and I'm new. My job is to get us all home alive. Alive, yeah. I want you to listen to me because I'm going to be right there with you. So then 45 days later, they promoted, promoted me uh, to a platoon sergeant. An officer was a platoon leader, but the 1st Division rotated him every six months. Right. So if he got sick, if he went on R&R, &R, I was the acting platoon sergeant right. at 22 years old yeah. and had control of these guys' lives. Did you feel qualified enough for it, or yes. were you, did you have any doubt in your mind about... When I, when I got there, I sat down with each guy in my squad, told them who I was, what I was doing, what's your job, what you've been doing, what don't you like about this platoon, what do, do you not like about leadership? Uh, you know, so... 68 was a bad, bad year. Right, so this, all of this uh, this information you're getting about these boys that you're going to be leading and stuff, this was all technically a few days before the Tet Offensive? No, uh, the Tet Offensive hit January the 31st, 68, and then they called it Tet 2. The, in May? In May. Yeah. And that was worse than Tet for Saigon because right. the NBA had had moved below, when they came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and cut across, yeah. that was sort of the line. Yeah. But after Tet, they had put NBA troops in, in about 20, 16 cities, I think it was. So the NBA had filtrated into the war zone C and the Delta acting as Viet Cong. Right.
Had, uh, so in your education that you got in boot camp, did you get a little bit of an overview of the history and culture of the Vietnamese people before you went over there so that you would have an understanding of the situation or not really? Uh, in AIT is when they, we gave it advanced infantry training. They gave us the book that I showed you on uh, Vietnamese phrases. The basic phrases, yeah. Right. And then, <clears throat> as far as the history of Vietnam, no. It was mm -hmm. current what's going on. Okay. And then a handbook for how to react with these people, treat them, etc., etc. It was a little pocket-sized book. And uh, that was it. That was it, period. So did you, for information like that that would be necessary for you in the field, did you mostly get it from older people who had been there a little longer and just be like, so... Tell me about Any, the people in these anybody villages. Anybody that had a suntan I talked to. <laughs> That's how you could trust them. <laughs> My first company commander was Hal London. Mm -hmm. He was Special Forces, Green Beret, and he was demoted and went through a court martial. So they moved him down to a company commander. Now here I've got a Green Beret, Special Forces guy that had been in Nam about seven months. He was absolutely the best commander I ever had, period, because of his military experience plus leadership. So this is the first few days that you're even in Vietnam and you're already having to deal with a violation of a treaty uh, that was agreed upon to be yeah. a ceasefire time. We were good guys. We lived up to our end. You know, you guys go home, visit your parents, take it off, nobody shoots, lay your guns down. The silver. So when it was was hitting, were you were you expecting it to go as said, or, or were you sort of thinking, no, they're going to do something? Uh, our alert teams, our uh, intelligence people came back to Westmoreland and said, you cannot do this. They're moving. They're all over. They're hitting here, going, going to hit here, here, and here. Well, they had moved troops into almost every major city in Vietnam, and mm -hmm. bam, all at one time. Yeah. And we said, okay, go home, celebrate. And our, our teams kept coming back. So our intelligence, each company had a, uh, a, a recon team. And they would come back and say, man, we got all kind of troop movement. They're just coming in off the trail and Westmoreland wouldn't listen. We got a treaty. Yeah, right. So they violated, but uh, Saigon was not that bad. It was bad, don't get me wrong. But it was something they weren't used to downtown side. I was in the field. Radios lit up. And uh, when you yelled Broken Era on the radio, when I would, if I ever, I didn't, but if I did, that meant we're being overrun. It, the radios were just unreal. We didn't know what was going on. We were told to get ready, everybody gear up. You were on a mission when this was no, happening? No, no, I was back in what they call a night defensive position. Okay. We did not have artillery. A fire base is when you have artillery, mm -hmm. and we had a permanent NDP, night defensive position. One uh, platoon would be in, one platoon that next day it would be out uh, recon in four RIFs, and then the other platoon would be on ambush that night, so you just rotate it. And then after five rotations, you had a day down. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily, uh, we were all inside the wire, and uh, I mean, the alarms went off, everybody was screaming, yelling, get we're going, we're going. And uh, then we were just waiting for orders for what to do. And uh, we were the castle guard for Saigon, the 1st Infantry Division. And all of a sudden, it just erupted. Then you heard gunshots. Oh, God, yeah, it was just, you just all you had to do was just turn your head 360 degrees and you could see green tracers and people fighting and, and everything. Now, this is out in the field, not mm -hmm. in the city. But even in the cities, it was going Before there's any light, right? This is it. Yeah, this is dark as it could be. And then all of a sudden, yeah, all of your phantom jets and all of everything came in, spookies. That's just, uh, yeah. yeah, the gunships. Yeah, the gunships. Helicopters were flying, and they weren't picking us up. They were just telling us to stand where you are, defend yourself, and kill anything that moves, walks, or talks. And it was a free fire zone for everybody. So anybody, we saw anybody coming towards us. We shot them, killed them, tried to kill them. So it was just absolutely pandemonium. And two days later, Saigon was secure. But they had troops that got in, but uh, the Marines and the people that were there, the uh, MPs and et cetera. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a, a, you know, 200 guys. It was sabotage groups, but they did penetrate. Well, let's talk about that first night for, for your position. Did you guys see a lot of people attacking your specific position, or were you sort of no. just on lookout on guard? We we were between a rock and a hard spot. 
Saigon was about 12 miles from where we were. So we were north of there. And um, so the main hit was all the major cities north of us. We included all of them. Uh, and then as you came down into Three Corps, then you had and lock, lock me and tame me. And so they had to come down that way. And that's yep. where, I, and we were right at the base of that Highway 1. Right. They call it Claymore Corner. So we were there, and uh, luckily we had an armor troop in the camp with us. APCs? Yeah, yeah. tanks and APCs. A complete troop. Yeah. So we were lucky, and uh, we, nobody tried to penetrate us. But we received mortars. Near the near the end of that, um, like on uh, February 2nd, okay. did they want to put you guys on APCs and move you to clean out Saigon? They just squeezed us in and put right. us on full alert. The three platoons that were one in, one out, uh, we all three went out on company operations. Okay. So uh, So in, in, thir in three corps, as they mopped up in Saigon, where did they, uh, did they start putting you guys back on search and destroy missions? Or was it? Uh, were they coming up with new ideas for how to fight the war immediately it was, after that? It was basically, I hate to use this word, reprisal. We agreed, we shook hands, you didn't do it, and we went into villages and searched them thoroughly. And that's when I told you we set up a picture about the hooch and the people. And uh, we definitely went after their caches, their equipment, and their supply lines. Harder than you had oh, earlier in '67. Yeah, big time. Big okay. Time, big time. And uh, I mean, we we went through villages, and when you didn't see young men or which was young normal, women, they're gone. Yeah. I mean, the children were there, and Mom and Papa Zahn was there, but elderly people. Yeah. So they, the Viet Cong and NVA, had extracted all the young people prior. Right. And when we went in a village and didn't see teenagers and people, we knew something was going on. But eh, maybe the VC are just recruiting real well. With right. Ted hit. And, well, the Viet Cong was basically uh, destroyed. The NVA was taking over leadership positions, and the Viet Cong were being guides, and et cetera. And so the B-900s that we were fighting, the VC that we were fighting. At this time in early 68, when you're kind of new to Vietnam, were you able to pretty easily tell apart like a local guerrilla versus a professional from Hanoi? Or Yes. You could? Yeah. Hanoi, you could tell the difference between Hanoi and the local VC. Mm -hmm. Their size was a little bit different, but not much. I'm more taller fellas. Uh, but you saw the professionalism in them. They'd been under leadership. Right. Where the Viet Cong were loose farmers, basically. That's a wide quote. Yeah. But um, then the NBA started dressing as VC. And uh, two ways. You walk up to a guy, you shake hands with him, and you feel the calluses. He's a farmer. But if you didn't feel a callus, he was not a farmer. He was likely a soldier. You look down at his feet, where his Ho Chi Minh sandals crossed, you yeah. saw the calluses on his feet. Yeah. And... Neil, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> take yeah. him in. We call the national police and they'd fly in, pick them up. Uh, we, I never saw a murder in Vietnam. Never saw a murder. Somebody so, like, if someone was arrested, what you're saying is you never we, saw anyone executed? No, no right. way. Um, American soldier, no. We did not do that. If somebody had if been standing there and one of my men shot them, I'd turn them in in a heartbeat. They get court martialed. Yes, yeah, easy. Yeah. But I never saw that. I never saw an American soldier kill an innocent civilian. I saw many, many of them kill Viet Cong. And at the last end, if you had a guy captured and, and uh, say, two or three of them, and one of them, you didn't know if he had explosives or what, I still saw American boys just come up and take a butt of a rifle and about knock them out, you know, yeah. <laughs> knock them to the ground and yeah. make sure they didn't have grenades or whatever. Yeah. But they never saw an American soldier do that. Did your Vietnamese get good enough to where you could ask basic questions like where well, weapons stuff were? Most of them, ironically, uh, out of the four that we had, three of them could speak pretty English? good English. The Viet Cong? Uh, they captured? came to our side. Oh, okay, okay. You, two hoys. Right, you, two hoys. you uh, flipped them. Yes, and plus uh, one, the guy that worked with me, Lloyd, um, he would say, G-I-S-A. I'd say, watch. Ah, uh, you taught him some English. And so he would write, what phonetically, watch. What it sound like. Then he would write the Vietnamese, then he would write French. And so... So these guys you captured were actually pretty well educated. 
Yes. They were the smart ones. They left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, we had one that couldn't speak. He didn't want to speak. The one that I told you about that they had killed his wife and two children. Mm -hmm. And he led us a machine gun team into the wide bridge in Saigon at Tet. And uh, a cobra came in, and he ran up underneath the bridge and huddled down, and the rest of the guys were killed, and they said he was a coward. Mm -hmm. And they went in. The village he was from was right near us and killed his wife and two children. He wore three bullets on his helmet. Mm -hmm. He wanted revenge. Yeah. So he didn't care about nothing except getting back to the guys that killed his family. But the other three were, they were, um, they didn't make good organs. But they, the organs didn't trust them. Could, were these people that you're talking about, are they ethnic minorities of Vietnam? Yes. Okay. Mainly. Okay. And I didn't have an education. I had uh, one guy whose father was a dentist in Saigon, and then he, jo he, he joined when he was in college, you know, the v Vietnamese, Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, so he grew up under the tutelage of BC. Right. But he was, uh, he dressed smart, good hygiene. And when we'd go out, you know, he'd grab me by the back of my straps and he'd hold me like that. And he said, no, 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 BC, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And whatever. He was good. It right. was, how can you help me? What's, we get to a ambush site. I'd say, BC? BC where? And uh, Lloyd would take off and he'd go over there and he'd squat down a little bit and then he'd come back over here and he'd look behind us and he'd come back and he'd draw it in the dirt mm -hmm. where he thought he said, BC maybe. B BC no. BC yes or BC yes. And so it helped me. He could just tell the signs of what was going on. Plus, so they put, I did not know this, but uh, they would tie a limb on a vertical tree. And so they tie a limb like that, and the long side of it that they tied was the way that they were needed to go. Mm -hmm. So as the VC were moving down the trails and they saw it like that, go that way. Mm. So there was things. Those that, secret signs. Yeah, yeah. and like the, uh, the fellow that I uh, got his equipment slingshotting and that rubber on that slingshot is as good as it was then today and so I asked the guy in Atlanta that worked for Westmore and I said what well, he's I said is this for shooting little birds or something he said did you ever hear ping? did you ever hear ping 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 is south ping ping is north oh it's so the signaling had, device yes wow. among other things and uh, they would hang uh, pieces of metal up in a tree and if they saw the soldiers coming this way, ping. That was a warning device. Wow, that was an interesting uh, primitive alert system. Those were things that you just don't hear about. And uh, you talk about brotherhood. So you got real close with the people you were working oh, with? Oh, extremely. I mean, I knew more about them than their mother and daddy knew about them. Yeah. I mean, what do you talk about? Well, I like Chevelles and I like, you know, Must I know Mustangs weren't out, but I like Chevelles and I like Dodges or Hemis or whatever. Yeah. You know, cars and girls. And, yeah. And then uh, you really get into their family life. You know, I had a boy that, uh, and his nickname was Kentucky. Everybody had a nickname. My name was Holden. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you didn't end up with a nickname? Yeah, Holden. Holden that's was what, your nickname? Yeah, that's what okay. they called me. And I said, hey, Holden. Yeah, and guys still today call me Holden. Yeah. But anyway, um, he was from Kentucky, and uh, I asked him, I said, well, have your parents send a picture of where you lived? Lived on the side of a mountain. And he said, I'm going to re-up. And I said, are you sure? And he said, yeah. He said, since I've been in the Army, I've had new shoes and new boots and three years a day and a roof over my head. Yeah. And, I, and he said how many brothers and sisters he had, and they've been in jail and killed and this. And I mean, it was just horrific. Yeah. So and this is a step up for him, even yeah. though it's his life's on the line every day. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so there was just different. I had a guy that talked uh, physics and French in high school, and he protested. And they, and when he protested, they pulled him out and drafted him. Wow. Bob Matson. He was the guy that gave me the month by a oh, week by week deal for his wife that yeah. I showed you. Yeah. He kept a diary. He, oh, letters he sent. He pulled. He extracted the military. So he was someone who was already politically aware before he oh, came yeah. over. He was college educated and teaching yeah. high school. Yeah. 
But he drafted and got uh, the draft board got a hold of him and he wound up in our company. Yeah. And uh, he and I were very close. He just died about two months ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're losing about 390 a day. Yeah. For us in May, it it just May is when it wrapped up. It just we call it tattoo. <laughs> We had them by, we could have just taken our thumb and squashed them okay. at that point. Okay. So they were regrouping. In this so in-between time, you were looking for their bases and oh stuff yeah, where they had... and finding them just okay. all the time because they had to get out of Dodge. When B-52s start coming in, you could put a 1,200-foot home down in a B-52 crater. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. And when they were doing the mass bombing, what that did, they had to regroup. They ran over to Cambodia. Mm -hmm. So they started building up their supplies and all that in Cambodia along the line, like uh, Hamburger Hill. Right. Uh, after that, they just literally miles, they crossed into Cambodia, and we couldn't chase them, bomb them, or nothing yeah. because of the agreements we made. So they reorganized, regrouped, and had fierce, selected fierce attack. The guy that came up with the M16 tried to sell it to the American Corps. The problem was it was too big to hit and they didn't like it. So he goes to Israel, and he's a stoner. Yeah. And that's a heck of a weapon. So anyway, they already knocked it off. And this weapon here, every component on it is pre-1970, with one exception. It doesn't have full automatic on it. So that's what I would do to go to full automatic. But uh, this is all, this is 1970, and this is 67, 66. Uh, early 65 and this is what was put on for the civilian version but in the military not civilian but at the time the army went to three shots and I'm not sure but today I think you pull it goes like that yeah when I pull this trigger it into that cartridge you know right. so what we do is tape them together and at the time you guys had 18 round mags we would we'd go less one okay we figured out the spring tension but uh, this adjust rod here the reason that the M16 gets a bad rep is when they first went over they didn't have this so if it jammed you had you know you had to get rid of the magazine and this could be hot as a pistol <laughs> and to, to get the cartridge out uh, once it had fired or was still loaded you either had to have something to pry it out or you had to take your magazine and beat on it and, you, and then they came out with this push rod and that, that helped get the shell out. So if the shell jammed, you just pushed it like that and the shell would come out. So the weapon itself is fantastic. The muzzle velocity, we had a demonstration at Fort Benning and they took an M14, which was the weapon of choice at that time, five gallon barrel of water. They fired an M14, it went through it and a stream of water came out. They pulled an M16 up, shot one, and it exploded. The muzzle velocity is numerous times more than the M14. But on the reverse side, we were on ambush one night, the guy walked straight up to us, saw us, he turned, and I turned and shot and ambush started and he was a pay officer well the bullet hit him right in the rear hip bone and he was down moaning after everything stopped so two of my men come up and grabbed him by the arms to pull him and he just let out a scream like you wouldn't believe and his arm pulled back and there was a hole about the size of a baseball mm, it had bounced around inside of him yeah yeah when it hit that bone it tumbled because the, the military version of the 223 has a hollow point in the back of it. And once it hits, it'll deflect or it'll tumble. Whereas an AK-47, 7.62, would go through a rubber tree. M-16 would not go through a rubber tree, unless you were just up close to it, because once it hit that rubber, it would go off. So you felt it was lacking in penetration power? Yes, in the jungle. Which is where you were using it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Either jungle or a rubber plantation or whatever. But, uh, you know, having to be, having a radio, my radio operator, I would carry it like this because I had a map. Yeah. And so I was looking at a map being a platoon sergeant. So um, uh, it was easier for me to carry it like this. And, and instead of holding it, because I had to use my hands, I had to pull the map out of my pants and, you know, where our locations were etc 
and then uh, the light weight of it was good. I tell you this, the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong women, mm -hmm. love this over an AK. Yeah. But an AK, my friend, will penetrate that jungle. It's a powerful weapon. You can drop it in mud, water, I don't care what you do, and it'll still shoot. No, the, the Russian version of it is real heavy. I mean, it's a, it's a machine weapon. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was great. Um, this is as close to getting to Vietnam that you can get. Yeah, as a civilian right now. Yeah. Riding on an APC or a tank, you're on top of it. And it's so hot, like a motorboat when you hit waves. That's the way they go. And sweat's running down your spinal cord. And it's like stand, riding behind a, a, a city bus in July with the exhaust coming from the other ones. Yeah. And <laughs> I called back the quartermasters and I told him I needed uh, 30 sweaters. And he said, sweaters? And I said, yeah. He said, man, you talking about long sleeve sweaters like you wear back home? I said, yeah. He said, what for? I said, well, it was 108 today. And last night it got down to 69. And it's cold. Yeah. We, had, we didn't sleep in bunks. We slept on the ground. We didn't have cots. And we would, we would make our air mattresses. We could get them back when we were in a fancy position. Uh, I was in the field for 251 days outside the wire, meaning I locked and loaded 251 days, ready to defend myself. So, First Division had he was supposed to get hot food once a week. Hot food once a week. Never happened. Yeah. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and I think about two times in between. Yeah. Sea rations. Yeah. So, anyway. So you hear all these different things, and uh, I'm sure there's 2,900,000 stories. Yeah. But uh, different things, different companies. The 1st Infantry Division was well disciplined. I could not go outside the range of a 155 howitzer. I could not go outside a 10-minute medevac or gunship. But I had Saigon, Benoit, Fuloy, right. Zeon. They were all around me. Right. So when I yelled for help, I got it. Right. I mean quick. Yeah. And uh, other things were coming off the Navy ships, it took a little bit longer. But the F-4s out of Benoit and, and uh, et cetera, they were right on top of me within, within 10 minutes from the time I called. So we were very, very fortunate to so, have all that firepower. So what happened in May uh, to your area? We saw more activity. Uh, we went 30 straight nights with a confirmed kill. I'm not talking about a blood trail. I'm talking about confirmed kill. We could, if we had a camera, <laughs> we could have put 30 straight nights. The activity, the movement of equipment, farmers moving stuff after the sun went down. It was just more activity than I had seen. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing mainly was bringing supplies in to build up to have a big fight. And with all this activity, uh, we sometimes we'd have all three platoons out on ambush and just a mortar platoon with some guys left back. Yeah. But the, the activity just unbelievable. And then uh, really, I'm going to say from the first uh, middle of June to the end of July, that that's when the hard second, it was fight, it was prolonged. It wasn't like a day or two. It was just build up more NBA troops. And that's when I started seeing the pith helmets and the uniforms and down south in three corps, we didn't see much of that. Yeah. But when the NVA come and when the Viet Cong were basically blown out of the picture, the NVA came in to support them and acted as though they were BC dressed in BC. Uh, I see. So then after that, it was it was over with. Yeah. If we had just kept the hammer down on North Vietnam, if we'd let the generals run it and let the people make decisions. And like I told you, when Al Haig was running for president, Kyle was a young boy at the time, but he came here uh, on his campaign. We went to see him, and I talked to the newspaper and said, I, I work over in Vietnam. So they arranged for me to meet him. So Kyle went with me, my son. And uh, so I was going to help him for his campaign, and about 30 days later, he pulled out. But uh, this man up here, 
sent by the varsity club. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, one day I go out to the mailbox and there it is. And this is our area of operations, this is Saigon. So this is Cambodian border. And uh, that's our area of operation. These symbols here represent each division, 25th, quarter cav, you know, on and on. Yeah. Fourth cav, and as you go, the Americal, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. all the way up. And that's, that's Vietnam, those are the companies and battalions and divisions. And then that's the first division, combat infantry badge, you might be infantry. And then the uh, bronze star with the metal, uh, with the V device, and I got a bronze star with the Meditorious. And these are others, it's not all of the ones I got, but that's they, that's what they put on there. Then he had that inscribed on it. Yeah. So that was a gift from him. Yeah, that's a good gift. And uh, so this is uh, the Order of St. Maurice. And uh, I was given this order and at the Medal of Honor Museum here. That's myself, General Raines. That's Captain Larry Taylor, who's up for the Medal of Honor. And uh, Ray Atkins. Mm -hmm. And then that's the uh, commander of our the VA club. And he uh, basically nominated me for this award and during the third century, <laughs> Roman Empire, this particular leader, was told to go into the village and kill everybody. Mm -hmm. and he refused. And uh, then he met death. But this was given to me. Uh, and they do a lot of research on you, make sure that your stories and things and your commitment after your service. Most yeah. of them are given during service. But this was given to me after service. For my, I worked with the uh, Royal of Honor Heritage Center here, volunteering with yeah. the Not Big. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, my story and my book and material, and I got involved on a volunteer basis, and then with my wife had a medical problems I had to pull out. All right, so we were talking about the activity uptick that was going on in May of 1968. Can you get into more details about that? Yeah, um, basically we rotated out of, <clears throat> we had three platoons and a mortar platoon. So the three platoons worked on a daily situation, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. One was inside the wire, one was out on recon and force, what we call rifts, and then the other one was on nighttime ambush. Mm -hmm. So we rotated and we had our system down pat, but with all of the activity in the villages, we could sense a buildup of trying to regroup and come back and hit again. Mm -hmm. So we were taking more kills on ambushes, nighttime ambushes, uh, more surveillance of daytime huge troop movements like Tan Fu Khan, Playboy Village was what we call it. Mm -hmm. And um, so the LERP team, 52nd Infantry of the 1st Infantry Division, Wildcat 2 uh, LERP team, spotted in the morning at sunrise approximately 250 NVAs moving with heavy equipment. Uh, you know, meaning big machine guns, yeah. anti aircraft weapons, etc. So they called back in and said that, hey, we've spotted a huge element moving across the northeast side of Tan Fu Khan in the open get out of here <laughs> now so anyway uh they got aircraft up and etc came in and they killed a huge number of them and confiscated a lot of weaponry new weaponry from different parts of the world uh and where they had communist and russian previously mm -hmm. now they're getting stuff from czechoslovakia and uh, east germany east germany oh, wow yeah those eastern european countries yeah. country. and uh munitions especially the russian munitions were already there but they started getting munitions just all kind of weaponry from other countries which we hadn't seen before or at least I hadn't heard of it, but uh, yeah. anyway, uh, that was a huge, uh, and here were wide open for the NBA. Why? Were they just getting sloppy about their movement? <sighs> I think it was a time element thing. Okay. That they were, instead of, if you get it, see there's three layers of jungle. You can have, uh, we call it just a scrub and brush type deal where an APC or tank could just run over and there wouldn't yeah. be nothing to it. It was sort of difficult for us to get through. 
and then you had double canopy. So you had small scrub brush, mm -hmm. and then it elevated because of lack of sunlight. And then you had triple canopy jungle to get a smoke grenade to be seen direct. So a pilot, if you popped a, <coughs> a red smoke grenade, it would just filter like this. And so the guy up top said, I can't tell exactly where you are. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we would do is we'd cut poles or whatever, sticks or whatever, put the smoke grenade on it, and then shove it up <laughs> as high as we position. could and pop it. Wow. And uh, that's how thick it was. Wow. I've got pictures of noontime. I had my watch like this, and it was 12 o'clock in the daytime, and you could barely see me and barely see my watch. Yeah. And that, it's called triple canopy. And the chopper pilots had a hell of a time getting us water. And uh, uh, then to get a medevac in, you had to do it with a, with a sling. Yeah. And then uh, like when Larry was flying his Cobra, he had a hard time uh, pinpointing where they were. He was afraid that he was going to hit us because the smoke it was not definitive. Yeah. And uh, so that I carried a little metal mirror in my pocket. And then at night, we had a strobe light. It was a little handheld strobe light. And it was orange. And it was assigned to me. And if I lost it, it was $1,500. Wow. But anyway, with that strobe light, they could see the strobe light okay. at nighttime. And, uh, but during the day, God, it was just horrible trying to get through it. And that's when, let's see, it was June. <clears throat> I think it was June. You no, know, July the 8th. When... Uh, the 11th Armored Cav, Colonel Patton, it had been given command the 1st of July. So he was doing some things in Saigon, and uh, we were opcon to them, meaning if he needed infantry, he called 2nd Battalion, 16th Infantry, and my platoon was the one that would go out with him, and then if he needed a company, the whole company would go. Mm -hmm. So I worked with him numerous times from July to December. And um, he got in a mess, and uh, so needed some infantry for help. We went in, and uh, uh, one of the guys that went to Fort Benning with me yelled out, holding, and I looked, and I cannot remember the guy's name, but I remember his face. I, he was from uh, uh, someplace in Michigan, I'll think of in a minute. But anyway, uh, he said, it's a hornet's nest, brother. And I said, well, come on. He said, we got a track off. And uh, so we went in, and that's when uh, the angel of death, you'll read in that. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, officers' quarters made in concrete, showers. When we went down in the medical deal, there was a Jeep engine transmission and a little drive shaft about that long that ran a generator. And uh, how did they get that half of a Jeep down in the hole? But anyway, anyway, it was there. So we just continued to see more movement of troops not only at nighttime, but daytime. And then we saw trucks moving. So they were bringing their trucks across from the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And uh, there was, they had a British truck that we blew up in that battle. And uh, it was English. I mean, it was uh, uh, like a deuce and a half type yeah. of truck, but it was British and it was been there forever. I don't know how long it had been there, but anyway, it was, it was working. Yeah. And uh, we blew it up, and Lieutenant Sankey, who was our company commander, wrote me uh, a letter saying, I found out about our venture into the compound, and he said that uh, they saw the uh, seven or eight trucks that we had destroyed. They, they were fighting so close to us, we couldn't call artillery because it, the fragmentation would hit us. Yeah. So I said, I told Lieutenant Carlson, I said, let's bring it behind them. Let's w w shoot over them and keep walking it towards them and make them come to us. Yeah. And he said, Mike, we don't have enough people. He said, this is a big, big deal. And I said, I know it's a big deal, but I'd rather have where they couldn't escape. Right. And then we could have the opportunity to get cobras in where cobras could pick them out. Right. To where artillery, you don't know where it's going. Mm -hmm. I hope it's in today with our telephones. We, yeah. can, we could leave it in a tank can. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we finally got, we fought them for six hours. Six hours. What? And so you know they had something they wanted to protect. Yeah. And when we saw the trees that were bent in and tied, and then you saw tracks that were wider than an ox cart 
then that's that's trucks. You know, um, ox cart and the Romans had it, and then that's why our railroads are so narrow. Same mm -hmm. deal. But when we saw the big wide and, and the earth had been eight to ten inches down, yeah. <coughs> so we knew they had something, and, and lo and behold, they did. It was a huge, huge base camp. Yeah. We had penetrated it. We didn't know it, and they didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. And by the time we figured it out, that's when the tanks and PCs started returning fire, but they were being flanked 360 degrees. Did the Big Red One end up capturing any major colonels during uh, that time? We, not that battle, but we did. We killed a colonel, a full bird colonel. Well, in our army, it would be a full bird colonel. And uh, a new AK-47 with a uh, almost a polymer... Uh, not stock, but the forearm mm -hmm. was, uh, was some type of polymer, not wood. Oh, okay. And it bit under, and uh, it was a modification of the AK-47. Oh. It was from another country. Oh, like Czechoslovakia or Somewhere something? Somewhere like it. Was, wow. And uh, when S-2 or S-1 security came out, that's when I cut the deal with the Major to, here's my stuff I want taken back to my box. Yeah. In return, I'll give you, he said, you don't have any choice, give me the rifle. Yeah. I said, uh-uh. I said, what's your D-Rose date? And he looked at me, what do you mean, what's my D-Rose date? I said, because I'm going to come get you because I had an Arvin buckle and all uh -huh. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the only thing he took was an Arvin buckle. But anyway, uh -huh. got it back, and uh, he let me take the, I got the bandolier with, with the actual magazine still wrapped in plastic with the Cosmoline in it. Wow. And uh, all of his... Uh, belongings, chopsticks, the slingshot, his oil can where he cleaned his weapon, his shoes, uh, his hat, bush hat. You said you hadn't seen one like that. No. <laughs> and that was the Arvins didn't want to wear a pith helmet on top of it. No, they didn't. <laughs> and then uh, there was one uh, that got a head long. You know, you see people uh, up in the north, they'll wear these hats with the pull down. The, like a Ushanka, like the Russians wear? Yeah. Yeah. And it had a and it was keeping the sun off them because they just weren't used to, <coughs> excuse me, the sun, some of the yeah. northern were, but we'd never seen that before. So we just, all of a sudden, we saw different activity, and it was heavy, heavy. Used to, in a bush, you may see four or five come down, you know, or something like that, or get lucky and hit a squat or something. But when I sat there, when I was telling you the story about the village that was below us, yeah. And I counted over a hundred, and that's when I called back and I said, fire for effect. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't give us a clearance because we were too close to a friendly village. Mm -hmm. So we never, I'd never seen that many NBA. Yeah. Full uniforms, tennis shoes, the whole bit. Wow. And so, and I kept saying, <laughs> fire, for, fire for effect, fire for effect. They wouldn't do it. Then yeah. all of a sudden, they were, you're too close to a friendly village. Mm-hmm. So you said, friendly. I said Ho Chi Minh and the National Guard just walked in yeah. with me friendly. Yeah. And then the next day I got a visit and uh, they didn't like how I handled it. And I said, you gave me the responsibility of 40 young men and whether they go home or not. And I said, if you want to take it, put somebody else up there. Right. So you, were you working close with another unit? No. I mean, I, we... So it was, it was literally about 40 people up against potentially 200 something people? I, I would estimate at least 150 because uh, they were in three groups, distinct groups, mm -hmm. not just one line. And uh, that way they could break off if right. they got hit. Yeah. And we were probably, I'm, going, I'm guessing, two and a half to three clicks away. That's it. Yeah. From, from where our uh, night defensive was, permanent night defensive there. Mm -hmm. I wanted one of uh, five fives or something to bring in on, but the, they feel they'd kill a lot of civilians. Yeah. And I knew then that the, the war was being controlled by Washington and, and headquarters in Saigon. Right. So uh, did you guys end up uh, taking on that platoon with just normal riflemen and... Uh, no way you'd do that. I mean, you'd be... With the VC coming to... Well, on my left side, they were already down. I don't know how many were there, but I saw the amber light clicking. And then when the NVA, they stopped, and I saw the green light flicking, so they were communicating. And 42 of us, and I counted over 100, and I stopped counting. 
So I, we were vastly outnumbered, but if I could have brought artillery in... It would have even the odds? Yeah, to my left and across the face of the village, not even in the village. I could have called it in front of the village and then off to my right. I don't know how many we would have killed, but at least I would know that we would have been safe. Mm -hmm. We didn't lose any men anyway because I cut off my radio and we just all laid down. Right. And just watched it. Okay. And uh, at this time, were you carrying uh, M16? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Th did you ever, at, at your rank, did you have the option to carry other things such as a shotgun? Or? Oh, no, a shotgun. Each platoon had a shotgun. And most of the boys had cut them off. And we had a Remington of all. And uh, it was, and they cut it off right where the choke is, basically, mm -hmm. and half of the stop cut off. And so, yeah, we all, we had shotgun, but we didn't have uh uh, the, the 15s, the, the short version, they were mainly given to LERPs mm -hmm. uh, and to special forces and SEALs and maybe a company commander would have them. But an AR-15 was, uh, unless it got handed down. Right. A lot of times different things happen, we wound up with different <laughs> weapons. So, right. Did, and, did your unit have combat engineers with like flamethrowers? Uh, those were, flamethrowers were in, my remembrance was with the armor. Okay. They were PCs and tanks. Okay. But the uh, at one time we had a complete troop of tracks. Uh, it was Sicily One, mm -hmm. uh, a whole troop of track vehicles. Uh, they had two flamethrowers, and then we had a 105 battery, and uh, then Bravo Company came over. So we knew something big time was going to happen, and we went out, and nothing happened. Yeah. I mean, it's just one of those deals. Yeah. But, uh, no, that's the only time I saw those. Yeah. Uh, did you ever use a M79 grenade launcher, or was that really uh, only a dedicated grenade? Or yeah, no, a... we, we, had a, we had a 79 guy that was dedicated in each squad. Okay. So we had four, three, three of them. For every four. four people, there would be one guy with them? Uh, no, M79, that's all he carried, that and a 45. Okay. And uh, this... Polish boy, we called him Ski because his name was about that long, yeah. Krzyzynski or whatever. Yeah. Ski, and he just loved that weapon. Yeah. And uh, he had little flechette rounds in him. Uh -huh. and then he had like solid, a shotgun. Yeah, with a solid slug in the end of yeah. it instead of a grenade. And he was just talk about a three pointer in basketball. He was part. He. I mean, get right on target every time. He, he, he was great. Yeah. And he just grinned like a possum every time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he died of cancer in '84, I think. Okay. He was one of the guys. But uh, oh, he was a, he was the best. Yeah. 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 So uh, after things wound down, after the mini tet, as it's called, uh, oh, what were you guys assigned to do? Same thing. We kept doing the same thing, going out on ambush, and we weren't told to keep the body. I mean, our body count down because we didn't have that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just didn't want us to take on a bigger element and suffer American lives lost because they didn't say politics. They said back home people are not buying it. They're, yeah. they're getting fed up with it. Yeah. So it was basically let's, let's shut this thing down. And uh, the month of October we didn't have as much combat. <coughs> and then the 1st of December, crack. I mean it just opened up again taking on larger elements. Okay. Yeah. Did you guys do a lot of um, things to try and win the people's hearts and minds at that time? We did up until pacification set in, and then the VC, or not the NVA, but the VC local would come in after we went in on go in and do some dental work, mm -hmm. or do medical work that the children needed, and medications and that stuff, and we'd pull guard duty, and then we'd have guys going through the hooches and checking to see what was there. They didn't keep stuff in the hooches. We knew that. They kept them in the tunnels and in that big haystack like yeah. I was showing you. Yeah. So it was darn if you do and darn if you don't for the villagers. Mm -hmm. If if they showed sympathy to us, the VC got after them. And then if they showed sympathy to VC, we got after them. Right. And uh, we just turned them over to the national police. They'd mm -hmm. fly in and those guys were tough. Yeah. They were mean Yeah. on their own people. I'd rather for them to be mean on their people than us. Right. It's uh, better for optics. Pardon me? Because it's better for optics. Definitely. Yeah. 
uh, here's an American boy smoking dope, beating up a Billinger or whatever. You know, just it's just horrible. Yeah, we were just treated like we were the cause of the war. I, yeah, I can never understand that. Yeah, no, it's just terrible. Yeah, and uh, so how long did you uh, have to serve uh, after that? Uh, it goes up to 1969. It, well, yeah, and uh, it was. Um, it was after Christmas because we brought they brought in hot meals. Christmas and Thanksgiving was the only hot meals I really had that I can remember. Yeah. So I went down in the village with Loy, and we got uh, one of the kids that was sort of the boss of the kids. So we lined them up outside the perimeter and brought them in and gave them plates, and they went through the line. And the only thing that they would pick out was the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> turkey, they sort of, the white turkey breast meat. But the yeah. other stuff, they, they, didn't they, trust they, it. they didn't like it. I got pictures of that. And <laughs> but um, it was just, uh, then I came in off of a mission. Uh, we'd gone out uh, for ambush that night, and then we riffed on our way back. And so I got back into the... On Thanksgiving night? No, after Christmas. Oh, Christmas night. Christmas, after Christmas, the day after Christmas. So uh, our first sergeant sent word down. My RTO, my radio operator, came in and said, Mike, the old man won't see it. I said, okay. So I'd go up and got on my flip-flops and green underpants because we didn't wear underpants because they get wet. It's too so hot. You just wore your pants, these yep. pants, your shirt, and socks, and shoes, and that was it. Mm -hmm. So I went up there and he said, uh, you want a cold beer? I said, a cold beer. I said, what do you think the answer to that is? He said, I didn't know if you drank or not. I said, well, yeah, I want a cold beer. And so he had an ice chest, and he'd have the Jeep guy go in and pick up their food and cold beers and cold drinks. And so he had a big ice chest, a huge ice chest. Yeah. So I said, God, that thing tastes like a million dollars. And he said, uh, how long have you been here? And I told him. And he said, uh, first of all, I got a tape recorder, and I, got, and I want you to walk me through what you've seen and done in this platoon so that I can use them down the road teaching methods of things that, hey, here's what he ran into, and this is what they did. And he said, you've served your time. He said, uh, I've been asked to send a sergeant that's proficient in radio communications with helicopters, artillery. I want you to go down and teach these guys how to do it. And I said, where? And he said, about 300 yards down the road. And he said, I got a guy coming in from Germany that's gonna take your place. I said, has he been to Nam before? And he said, no. I said, come on, Tops. You gotta find somebody that's been here. He said, well, he's got a rank and he's been in and he's a good leader and so he's replacing you. I said, I don't care what he does from this point, but he, I don't want him to get my boys hurt, Kill you him. know? <laughs> so I said, okay. So he said, go down and get your gear. I'll have him, I'll call him up here, then you can exchange information and take what time you want with him. And uh, he said, the Jeep's coming back this afternoon to bring us some reports and stuff, and he said, I'll take you down there. Yeah. So Jeep took me down to the compound. Yeah. It'd be like our National Guard. Yeah. It's, it's the village guys are not Arvins. Right. They're like a militia of sorts. That's, that's it. That's yeah. the best word. They'd go home when it got dark. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah. I didn't know they were going home. But um, so I went down there, and it was almost 30 days I spent there. Yeah. And then one day they called me, and they said, Jeep's coming to pick you up. I said, what are we doing? He said, we're taking down Pagoda Inn, and uh, your D-Roast is here, so we're just going to send you back. And This was in 69? Yeah. Well, he, uh, January? He, yeah. And he said, you're done. Yeah. I said, no, we're not. Almost. We got to get from here to, to right. Zion. Right. Without being ambushed, shot, or whatever. It was right. Broad daylight, middle of the day. So we got back to Zion, and uh, I went down to where they were bringing in new troops and uh, took a good, long, hot bath. Got, got in brand new fatigues, went down to the barber shop, got my hair cut, went over to NCO Club. I drank a few beers <clears throat> and uh, went back to my hooch and laid on a mattress for the first time in probably three months. Yeah. And I just slept. Yeah, you slept good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I slept at least 14, 18 hours. Yeah. And I got up and I didn't know where I was. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, then the process of getting out mm -hmm. and I came home. Yeah. And uh, was that process to get out a, a long time? Uh, uh, like a basic army. Yeah. 
turn in your goods, right side, throw your old stuff in, get your new stuff, go through medical, hit each medical person. So I checked out on a Sunday. So when they gave me my medical charts, I just kept them. I got my original medical chart. Did they ask you any questions about Agent Orange back in those days? Oh, they didn't even know. Agent Orange, what you talking about? No, okay. not at all. All I know is we were the heaviest spray in the, the four cores yeah. because we were rice paddies and jungles. Right. And um, up north, they didn't need it that bad, but we were the, and this, is, this came from the uh, American Legion and the Veterans Administration. They colored saturations of the zones and around Saigon it was just red. Yeah, we, they would chopper us out, you know, take uh, 5, 10, 15 choppers and set us down, we'd set up a daylight ambush and then they'd say at 2.13 and so three planes would come over and they'd just file and spray Yeah, Orange and then we'd set up our bush and then if that night, if nothing happened that night, I would set up, keep the bush up and the next morning we'd go in and it'd be dripping. And uh, I've got a picture of a bomb crater, water's about up to my waist and gray. <laughs> and my buddy and I are buck naked standing in the bomb crater wringing out our fatigues, pants and shirt. From Agent Orange? Shaping them and putting them back on. Wow. I've got nine different things. Yeah. Cancer of the prostate, I got a, a, on my pancreas, I got a, a lesion. Took out my gallbladder, uh, had prostate cancer, four-way bypass, three of them failed. Agent Orange is eat, <coughs> eat me alive. Yeah. Now you look at TV, if you use Roundup and we're near a farm, you can get considerable compensation. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, uh, that covers most stuff. So let's talk about uh, where people can find more information about this stuff and uh, what you're trying to accomplish with your book. Uh, <clears throat> my son and I are in the process of setting up a site. Uh, it's called Told to Go. That's the name of my book. And um, <clears throat> we bought the, uh, whatever you call it, uh, the rights to it mm -hmm. uh, for $38 and we own it. Yeah. So what we're wanting to do is set up the book and get it started and uh, where you can follow it. And then if you want a written book, then we'll have the address in there where to contact and we'll have a supplier that's going to do the work for us to get the book distributed. Mm -hmm. I've, been, I've just been with so many, talking to so many publishers, it's almost impossible unless you've already written a book or you're a great writer. Yeah. And uh, they don't like to write too many Vietnam books. Yeah. But mine's not a Vietnam book. No, this book is basically to explain about um, what it's like for someone to get that letter to be drafted in their life. And you have no choice. Yeah. And your life changes. Yeah. Dramatically. Yeah. And uh, just like when I took my two fingers and stuck in that wound, uh, I couldn't stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. I would have never known to have done that. Yeah. There's a lot of things that I learned in the military and uh, perseverance, strictness. My son says I have super ADT, yeah. <laughs> attention deficit disorder, <laughs> because I like things done right. Yeah. <clears throat> but it gave me, I was sitting in a rubber plantation on my helmet. And we'd just been in a fight. And I was sitting there and the sun was filtering through the mosquitoes. I had to put a towel up over my face. They were just so thick. And I said, if I can lead men doing this, I should be able to lead men in business. Yeah. And that's what I did. Yeah. And I was vice president of a, a company that took over. We were doing $7.5 million. Ten years later, we were doing $110 million. Wow. I had uh, six divisional managers. I had... Uh, almost 100 salesmen, six national account guys, and I spent 48 years in the furniture business. Mm -hmm. And the only dope I've ever done is one that a doctor gave me. Yeah. And so I'm not a pot-smoking baby killer. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the history of this thing is, is, is the process. It's from the letter until here I am 77 years old. Mm -hmm. And went back to Vietnam and uh, spent four years in Russia. So, I think I've committed to my country. 
<laughs> obviously did my job. Yeah. And we came out well, and here I am today talking to you, and I'm not going to forget it. No. And like I said in my book, until the last Vietnam vet is dead, the stories will not end. Yeah. And we're getting there closely. Yeah. 390 a day, veterans are dying. Yeah. So by 25, there won't be a whole lot of us left. No, not many. So something like this, you can tell your children and grandchildren, or your class. Yeah. So, you know, the Medal of Honor offers a class, and they send material. It is unbelievable that they send to these teachers. State of Tennessee, the governor said, every school can have it, they just got to have a volunteer teacher. And the information that they provide to teach these children about the war, it's not just Medal of Honor guys, it's about the commitment, the integrity, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And it's a, the teacher can take it, they got workbooks, and it's free. Yeah. That's so that's a way, it would be a way to teach our children because obviously we're not doing it in our curricula. Yeah. So.